Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you for listening and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel. On this episode, I'll be speaking with Chinese-American author Iris Young about her book, Wings of a Flying Tiger. We explore her characters, talk about her life journey, and what writing a novel has done to help her in some of her darkest moments. So please join me as we listen to an excerpt from her book, Wings of a Flying Tiger by Iris Young. One look at Dead Man's Pass, and Danny understood why Daisy didn't want to take this route. The gorge was one of the deepest canyons in the world. Between sheer, rocky cliffs, the two sides were connected by a narrow bridge made of rough wooden planks intertwined with ropes. It was no more than 20 yards, but it wasn't for anyone with a faint heart. One missed step would send one down the deep gulch. The bridge was too narrow for two men to walk side by side, and it was not possible for one to hop from one plank to another. Wasting no time, Birch bent down in front of Danny, and before the American could argue, Birch picked him up on his back. The 200-pound weight made him stumble. Sucking in a breath, he stabilized himself. With both his hands, he readjusted and secured the man's position on his back. Without turning, he shouted to Daisy, Wait here, I'll be right back. At five feet ten, Birch was tall for a Chinese. He'd grown up tall and strong, just like his parents wished for him when they had named him after the white-barked birch tree. Danny was six feet three, a heavy load. The primitive bridge was challenging for anyone to cross, but it seemed like an insurmountable task to carry another person on one's back. Birch bent forward, adrenaline coursing through him, as he trudged one step at a time. His heart hammered wildly, and his pulse quickened. The decayed boards and rotten ropes threatened to break at any moment. No matter how brave he was, he couldn't help but wonder if the old bridge could hold their combined weight. Grab the rope, yelled Birch. Two lines at waist level flanked the bridge. The one on the left side was limp, almost useless. Danny clutched the rope on the right. The planks creaked and the bridge swayed under their weight. The springy movement brought a ripple of goosebumps into Birch's skin. Cold mountain updrafts sent chills up his spine. Below, he spotted a hawk. With several deliberate beats of its powerful wings, the bird drifted, swooped, and dove suddenly when its prey came into view. With a shrill cry, it disappeared into the fog above the river at the bottom of the gorge. The endless abyss took Birch's breath away, but he remained focused and proceeded slowly. At one point, a piece of plank broke. He didn't see it happen, but he heard it, the snapping sound, and then Danny's gasp. His heart sank. How big is this gap? Will it be trouble when I come back for Daisy? Sweat poured into his eyes, but he didn't have the time or a free hand to wipe them clean. Sheer determination propelled him forward. Halfway across, they heard yelling from a short distance away. It was in Japanese. Yamero, stop! Birch picked up the pace. Daisy had watched nervously as Birch navigated the bridge. To prevent himself from crying out loud, she bit her knuckles. So focused was she on her loved ones that she didn't hear the Japanese closing in from behind. They laughed and shouted at her, signaling her not to move. But Daisy broke into a frantic run and sprang onto the bridge. It was too late. A couple of steps later, with a loud blast and her scream, the old bridge broke in the middle. The soldiers probably meant to frighten her, to slow her down, but the hand grenade had damaged the already rotten structure and it snapped cutting off the only escape route she had. Now, she was separated from the two men she loved. All right, and we are back, and I am here with Iris Young. And um, Iris, how are you doing today? Great, wonderful. Thank you. So now, when did you begin writing fiction? About 
15 years ago, I started by writing short stories and then novels. Wow. So you've been doing this for quite some time then. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now... It- it takes a long time to write a novel. <laughs> yes, it does. It does. But then you can get mm-hmm. a good novel out of it because you spend a lot of time with it, and that's good. Um, now, your book is based mm-hmm. on historical events. How did you approach your research? Mostly by reading other people's books, like history books. And, of course, I also check online for different um, resources as well. Yeah, that's that's a good way to approach it. Now, you were born in China do you find that the literature in China is different than that of the United States? <laughs> um, I think a good story is a good story. All good stories have similar qualities of intriguing readers and touching people's heart. And also there are tons of literatures in China dated from thousands of years ago. There are many different styles in literature in China, so it's very hard to compare But one thing I noticed is in classic Chinese novels, the narrative is really a storyteller. At times, the narrative speaks to the readers directly and make comments um, about the story. Like, for example, in classic novels, each chapter ends with questions about what's going to happen in the next chapter, like what so-and-so is going to do, and what would happen if he's going to do this, and if you want to find out this and that, and keep reading. So, <laughs> yeah, and I think this time. Yeah, mm-hmm. And that's one thing, too, with like Chinese and Japanese literature has kind of moved over mm-hmm. here to the U.S. in a lot of ways, um, because people have come in from China and Jap- Japan, and they have brought their mm-hmm. stories, and it has really added to our melting pot here. Um, I was um, sitting and watching some anime cartoon. And I have to tell you, it was amazing. The storytelling that that comes with that, it's really original Uh and it's very unique. And the sad thing is, Mm -hmm. is here in the U.S., we really don't have a lot of unique ideas anymore. We have a lot of regurgitated ideas. And so when you see something like an anime come in, and it's just a cartoon to a lot of people, but when you see the story and you you hear the Mm -hmm. characters and the whole thing is just... It's beautifully done. Mm -hmm. It really is astonishing. And that's one thing, though, too, is China has such a deeper history than what U.S. does. Right. Because we are kind of like a a mishmash of of other cultures. China has their own Mm -hmm. unique culture. And it's something Mm -hmm. that when you bring it to a table of literature, it really is Mm -hmm. amazing. So anyhow, now tell us a little bit about The Wings of the Flying Tiger. Okay. It's a historical novel about the rescue of an American pilot in World War II in China. And this pilot, Danny Hardy, um, he belongs to the American Volunteer Group. It was formed under President Roosevelt's executive order. It was in the spring of 1941. America wasn't at war with Japan yet. The U.S. military pilots traveled to China with fake passports. And they were young and adventurous, but they had no combat e- experience. And they were not even trained to fly P-40, the plane they were going to use. So the Japanese thought very little of this small group of inexperienced American pilots. But with sheer determination and courage, in half a year, they destroyed nearly 300 Japanese aircraft and um, about half a million tons of Japanese supplies. So the Chinese people, well, and also their plane were decorated with shark face. So the Chinese people call those courageous American pilots, feihu, which means flying tiger, because tiger has always been highly regarded in Chinese culture, and it's a symbol of bravery, strength, and power. So Danny Hardy um, is one of the courageous American pilot. He's a larger-than-life hero in my book. (laughs) But (laughs) But this story actually starts much earlier. It was in 1937 when Japan invaded Nanking, the capital of the Republic of China. In six weeks, the Japanese soldiers killed 
300,000 Chinese and raped over 20,000 women. And on the verge of this massacre, Jasmine Bai, the other main character, a college student, returned to Nanking trying to convince her parents to leave the city. She was too late to save her parents, but in time to witness the horrors, and she survived the massacre, thanked to a small group of Westerners and mostly Americans. They formed the International Safety Zone that saved 300,000 Chinese, half of the population at the time. The other half were all killed. And it's because of this experience that Jasmine developed her hatred for the Japanese and her love for the Americans. Of course, later when she found a wounded American pilot, she risked her own life to save him. And along with her two cousins, a whole village opened its arms to heal this American pilot, a flying tiger. When his wings were damaged, the Chinese people were the wings of this flying tiger. They helped, they healed him and helped him to fly in the end. So it's a story about love, sacrifice, kindness, and bravery during one of the darkest hours in Chinese history. Wow. And, and you know, you have some really amazing symbolism into this. Like you were talking about uh-huh. the wings of the plane and the wings of the pilot. Uh-huh. You know, it's something right. that it gives me chills. You know, it really does. Because it does make you think, you know. I mean, for one... Mm-hmm. In the U.S., we also have a story, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, is the story between Pocahontas and John Smith. And it's that. Oh, cult, I know that. <laughs> yeah. Very, very beautifully done story. And, and it's based on mm-hmm. a real events. Um, mm-hmm. The entire thing with this is that this is also based on real events, but it's still it's that concept mm-hmm. of transcending cultural boundaries, you know, Um mm-hmm. Now, I have another question here. Mm -hmm. Because of the inspirations that you brought into this book as far as the historical inspiration, for you, Mm -hmm. what what was the inspiration to actually write the book? Okay. Well, it's a work of fiction. But to me, a Chinese-American, it's also personal. My mom and grandmother left Nanking days before the massacre happened. And both my mom's family and my father's family end up in Chongqing, where Japanese bombed this wartime capital regularly. This part of the um, story also in my, included in my book. My father told me the sight, the sound, and the smell of the bombings. And she, he was only four years old. He had nightmares for years. And once they lost all their belongings. So this story is also very personal to me. And while I was growing up, I, I grew up in China. Um, China was a isolated country. We were told that Americans were devils and American soldiers were crude and coward. I did not know anything about the flying tiger until I came to the U.S. as a graduate student. And I was touched once I learned the truth and I wanted to thank the flying tigers So what would be a better way to show my gratitude than writing a book about them? As a Chinese, I'm thankful to the Flying Tigers' bravery and sacrifice. And without their help, the course of the Chinese history might have been changed. And my family may not have survived. And I may not have existed in the first place. And as a U.S. citizen, I'm honored to write a book about uh, American heroes. I think it's a privilege and also a duty to write a book like this. Well, and we are very honored that you've even been on this show and that you have given us this book. Even though it is fiction, the elements are Mm -hmm. there, okay? The elements of Mm -hmm. helping somebody outside of who you know within your own country, extending that hand, mm-hmm. that right there is mm-hmm. paramount. So thank you so much. It's it's amazing oh. that you've added to our culture in such a way that um, you've even well, just given us this so book. Much. I mean, I, I hate mm-hmm. to say this. I mean, 
Iris, you have added to our culture with just this single book. This is this is a big thing, and I I want to tell everybody out there who's listening. When you add anything to a culture, okay, either good mm-hmm. or bad, it affects things in the future. Mm-hmm. And with you, mm-hmm. Iris, you have given us this book as a fictional story, but yet the heartfelt feelings are there. And, and we say this all the time on this show, your characters reflect human nature. And human mm-hmm. nature, in your sense, can be extending that hand to help somebody else out. And, you know, now you have a little bit more going on here than just helping out. I mean, Jasmine Bai, who's the art student, and her cousin Daisy Bai both fall in love with the same man, right? <laughs> so how, yeah. do, how do you see, how does each character show their love differently towards this American? Well, Jasmine Bai was about 23 years old when she met this American pilot, where Daisy was only 17 years old. Jasmine was a little more bit more mature and although she was courageous in many ways she was a little traditional than daisy she was more reserved and she expressed her feelings in more subtle ways although she was willing to sacrifice her life if needed for the man she loved and daisy was young and cheerful and sweet she's a lot more open in expressing her emotions and like her name she was sweet and she was as fresh as daisy she i to me i i think she had a innocent and pure heart my story really this war was so horrible that i wanted to create likable characters like jasmine and daisy to offset the horror of this that situation yeah and it's amazing to me too that the the cornerstone of this story is love, you know, and mm-hmm. that you have d- two different diverging love uh, styles here, one that's a very innocent love and one that's a very mature mm-hmm. love. And mm-hmm. th- the funny thing is, is that those also transcend cultural boundaries. You know, love is, is mm-hmm. when you are willing to give your life for somebody, it doesn't matter what country mm-hmm. you're from, that shows love. That's right. So it, it's That's very right. unique. So thank you very much for that. Now, have you ever been in a love triangle situation similar to your characters? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I hate to ask you this, but it's it's one of those things, you know, where, you know, I mean, I have a brother and me and my brother, we mm-hmm. both fell in love with the same girl in high school. And it was like, oh, oh no, <laughs> it was really bad. <laughs> we were fighting against each other all the time because, you know, one of our, <laughs> one of us were going to take her to the prom and we just couldn't decide who. But uh, <laughs> it was horrible. But have you, have you ever been in a situation like that? No, nothing like that, no. Oh. But um, this is a great thing about fiction writing, because as a writer, I can create the characters I admire and want it to be, and the kind of love story I'd love to experience and love to have. Um, I really enjoy reading those touching and heartbreaking love stories. This is my chance to create such a love story, that hopefully it would touch my reader's heart and would stick with them for a long time. That's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> yep. All right. Now, okay, so you graduated from Wuhan University and was accepted to the CUSBEA, which is the China-United States Biochemistry Examination and Application Program. A mouthful. <laughs> okay. <laughs> then you came to America with very little money and poor English. Uh, you had been you received a PhD in molecular biology, trained as a postdoctoral fellow at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, and worked at the University of North Carolina. How did you find time to write a novel? Well, it, I have to uh, answer this question like way back then. Um, I grew up in a family of professors. I've always loved reading. Even before I was born, my parents and my grandparents had bought tons of books for me. But however, I did not read most of them. During, do you know anything about Cultural Revolution? Mm-hmm. During Cultural Revolution, Red Guards came to our home and took those books away. I read a few leftovers again and again because there were not many books available to us. Like for almost 10 years, all the libraries were closed and bookstores had nothing except 
political stuff. I was really hungry for books, and but luckily I had my father. My hometown Wuhan is one of those three furnaces in China. We had no air conditioning and no electric fans. In those hot summer evenings, we sat outside and surrounded by neighboring kids. My father told us lots of stories, including Chinese classics and Western classics. So his word really took me all around the world and fell in love with literature. But creating creative writing, um, it was a dangerous career in China. My grandma was the first Chinese woman to receive a master's degree in the UK, and my aunt received her master's degrees from this country, US. Um, both of them became famous writers and translators, but both of them were wrongfully accused as anti-revolutionary writers. My aunt was sent to a labor camp for many years and my grandmother was fired from her university job and sent back to her hometown. She actually died there alone. I had to choose something safer to study science, although I wasn't passionate about science, and, but fiction writing, it was too dangerous for me to to be a career in China at the time. When I came to this country, or many years after that, I started writing, not because I wanted to write a book, but because I was desperately needed help. Um, I was very shy and fearful when I was young and trapped in an unhappy marriage. I became negative and depressed, but luckily I tried very hard to change the situation by reading lots of self-help books. And one book said that if you write down five positive things a day, in 21 days you can change your mindset from negative to positive. So I started by jotting down five positive things a day. And it, at first it was just simple words or phrases, but in time, words change to sentences, then sentences to paragraphs, then paragraphs turned into pages. Um, I did not change in 21 days. It took me two years. <laughs> the end result is remarkable because I'm, I'm happy to say I'm no longer a negative person. And the side effect of this practice is I started writing short stories and novels. Um, when you talk about finding time, in 2010, my father was dying of cancer. So I had to quit my job at University of um, North Carolina, and I went back to China taking care of him. Half a year later, he passed away, and I stayed another two and a half years to take care of my mom, who had strokes years before that. And during that time, I started writing, and when I came back, I really just decided not to go back to science because I'm passionate about writing. Um, I took off driving to Alaska by myself from North Carolina, <laughs> and and along the way I started writing. And I'm it's been it's been years that I started writing full time. So that's how I found time to <laughs> to write. Well, it's another good thing is that you've surrounded yourself with positivity positivity that comes mm -hmm. from your writing and if it's something that you love if it's something that's already in your mm -hmm. heart and you just need to get it down on paper then that's an amazing mm -hmm. way to to get over depression and things like that and so i commend you for that your your parents and your grandparents must be extremely proud of you um with all your accreditations with writing this novel with bridging so many cultural barriers with overcoming mm -hmm. depression and fear and anxiety and all of this stuff, you've really added mm -hmm. to our culture. And I, I, I want to say it, it is amazing um, to hear your story you. about this. Because honestly, before I even started this mm -hmm. interview, I'd done a little bit of research on you, but I didn't, I didn't know everything. And I must tell you, you are an mm -hmm. incredible person. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> it, it really is incredible. <laughs> Now, to me, this is the American dream, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you get to live it. Um, and then, what, have you been to Disney World yet? 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, good. Because that's like part of the American dream too. We, we all have, have to go to Disney World at some time. So now the Will of the Tiger is coming out soon. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're going to do in the next novel? Well, it's very hard to talk about it without giving away the story. <laughs> um, Will of a Tiger. It's a sequel of Wings of a Flying Tiger. Well, I can tell you once again, readers will meet the characters in the first book. And it's from Yunnan province to Chongqing, then to Taiwan. This story actually ends in San Francisco. Oh. It's an epic journey of survival, hardship, friendship, and of course, love. It starts in the summer of 1945, a few weeks before the war against Japan ended, but it, it covers about 20 years. Um, I, I can't tell you too much about it, but it's available for pre-order on my publisher's website, which is open-bks.com. Uh, all right. <laughs> Did you guys hear all that? Because it's up for pre-order, you know, that's, that's a good opportunity to get uh, first dibs on this book. Now, you've been mm -hmm. doing this for a while, okay? To me, you're a very mm -hmm. inspirational woman. Um, you. you have gone through more than what people can, can count on one hand. And I just want to ask you, what advice would you give mm -hmm. somebody who is an aspiring author, if they're from another country, what advice would you give them about achieving their dreams? Well... It doesn't matter whether you're from another country or you're from this country. Writing is hard. Um, if you don't have a burning desire, actually just don't bother to start. But if you do have a passion for writing, well, don't let anything or anyone stop you. Because craft is something you can learn, but passion really comes from somebody's heart. And we should follow our heart. And there are things while I was writing, I kept on telling myself, like, keep writing, don't give up, persistence, per per preservation, patience. And also there are several Chinese proverbs um, I can share with mm -hmm. other writers. Well, first one is, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. All those are Chinese Proverbs. And the second one is every step leaves its point. And the third one is if you work hard enough, you can grind even an iron rod into a needle. <laughs> I know it would be hard, but that's the Chinese proverb. <laughs> and you know what, Iris? It, my the, word for it. And the funny thing is, I've heard every one mm -hmm. of those proverbs. And the, the uh -huh. it's so integrated into our culture now. The Chinese culture has mm -hmm. been so integrated that I have heard those proverbs before. I live by those proverbs. Um, I'm sure that anybody mm -hmm. listening to this uh, this podcast has heard those before, which is amazing because we all strive for that. It doesn't matter where you're from. We mm -hmm. all strive to succeed, to, right. to better ourselves, to follow our hearts. And I, I, mm -hmm. I want to say it again because it's just a remarkable story that you've put together in your entire life. Um, you are an amazing person, and I want to thank you so much for being here on the show today. Well, thank you so much. It's an honor All and right. a pleasure. <laughs> All right. And, folks, you can check out Wings of a Flying Tiger. You can get that on Amazon.com. And you can check out Will of a Tiger on pre-order at open-bks.com. And uh, Iris, I want to thank you one more time for being here on the show. It was amazing. Thank you so much. It's Our a pleasure. <laughs> All right. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality.